May Day, a composition in four cantos by J. M. Cologne and Oliver Marsh. light in his window, gray, awake he realizes, alone, gray and light rain, the light is gray, and he is not quite alone, for the city gray. Waking comes slow to this city. Are you awake? asked the man who lives here. No, he lies. The man laughs, thinks it is a joke. The light from the window is gray. There is a futon, a stove, a hardwood floor with dust that tracks on one's fingers, a modernist lamp, a laptop playing the radio, a desk of unpaid bills and unwritten novels, a fat Siamese cat in its litter box, and the man who lives with them. They are gray from the light. He groans. The radio says, Waiting for the president to speak to our men and women in uniform today in a speech at Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan, or correspondent in Afghanistan, bringing you live coverage. But first, today's headlines. About 80,000 gallons spilled from rural Louisiana oil pipeline over the weekend. No injuries reported. A woman left paralyzed from the waist down seven years ago was walking again thanks to a new exoskeleton device called the Rewalk. Federal judge imposed an injunction preventing the state of Texas from cutting state funding to Planned Parenthood National Childhood Diabetes Rate growing at an alarming rate. Do you want tofu? No, he says. He has a headache. goes to the medicine cabinet. Advil cold and sinus, he thinks, but it is an empty box. The man he lives with is feeding the cat. His forehead throbs. It will kill him, he thinks, one day soon. It will kill him. They will find him dead from it, covered in pus, his head exploded. It will have killed him after streaming in through the gray window. What will it have mattered? The radio is talking about diabetes and autism. Still sick, the man asks. Worried, curious, annoyed. 
I'm always sick, he wants to say, but instead he says nothing. On the way back, he steps on a used condom. He despises the man he lives with. He despises the cat and the radio and the tofu. He despises the books he reads, self-help literature about sleep patterns and relationships and how to keep the body gym fit and flexible and full of fluids. And he tries to ask himself why he hates these things, but he doesn't quite know. Did you eat yet? No. You're going to be hungry. You don't even know what hunger is, he thinks. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm not looking at you like anything. Slashed open his right hand Monday after slamming it in frustration against a fire extinguisher's glass case on the way to the locker room. The acting inspector general of the Department of Homeland Security has announced an investigation into the Secret Service following the Colombian prostitution scandal. The man he lives with puts down the pan with the tofu. It has to stop. I'm not doing anything. You're not talking to me. I'm not doing anything. That's your problem is you don't do anything. After reviewing his role in the phone hacking scandal, the investigative panel said he is not a fit and proper person to... You don't do anything. You just lie there all day and all night in bed, catatonic like you have some disease or chained to your desk staring at the screen of your laptop in the dark while I sleep. Not sleeping, I'm watching you, and you're doing nothing. It's empty, like a zombie, like some kind of empty shell. And I have tried, you cannot see it, but I have tried to make this a home for you and for me. I have tried to break through, but I could not. There was never something there inside of you, inside your eyes, which could have made it better. Don't you see that I have tried? And it's unfair to expect that I could have done it any other way, but it's not good enough for you. No matter what I do, it isn't good enough. And every moment of every morning is a hell, not because hell is other people. I tried telling myself that, but hell is not other people. Hell is you. You carry it around inside you, like everywhere. It infects the floorboards, and sometimes when you aren't watching and you aren't there, I have to go to the window and shout into the gray of the city because everything that was ours was only mine. I want out, 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 out. The man he lives with wants to say, but all he lets out is a quiet sigh, like a whimper. And he understands. It is a quiet condemnation. The judge had only to stare out his sentence. The law court was absolute. The verdict was death. The crime was being born. Calling for a general strike against the, across the country today in commemoration of International Workers' Day here in New York City, the usual May Day festivities are being supplemented by the Occupy Wall Street movement, which is planning to organize group events, picket lines, and a march in a bid to regain momentum. The movement lost after its expulsion. I have to go out, he says. He walks out the door and leaves.
hot dog stand hawkers, cars, buses, taxis, trucks, joggers with iPods broadcasting digital cardiographs, and he is alone, sickening sweet smell of unpicked Hell's Kitchen garbage, light rain, the forecast said, but it is always gray light. It falls from the sky, slides down the concrete, gathers all things up in a swirl, and slips between your fingers before you can capture it. And soon, you realize you miss what's gone down the drain. He ducks into the corner liquor store. Harsh lighting filthy floor, smell of open containers, shoes make unpleasant noise on mud track tile. It's a comfort to him, like home. At counter, a sad-faced Indian man and a bellowing Puerto Rican woman arguing. He goes to the stacks, Indian man's children, twelve, sixteen, and seventeen, reshelving the Bacardi, cursing playfully at each other in Tamil. Where are the cold drinks? He asks, twelve. Ah... Uh, Sixteen smacks twelve on the back of the head. Hey! In the back, sixteen answers. Twelve swears violently in Tamil, prompts another smack. Thank you, he says. Wonders. Tamil, an ancient language, its profanities must be magnificent, medieval, mystical. He gets to the fridge, thinks, what will kill me fastest? It is his private joke, a game he plays. There is beer, beer, light beer, lager, beer, light beer, malt liquor, tempting, cost fatalities in New Jersey, but no, to college, doesn't want to seem desperate, decides against the cold, too gray a day for a cold drink. He goes for vodka instead, buys a bottle. Down 10th Avenue, the streets are emptier. Empty, empyrean, gray, half-developed storefronts, bodies animated only by a vague sense that they are there because they happen to be there. He fusses to get the bottle open, screws it loose, spills only some on himself, like some bum, in a brown bag so as to hide from cops who would come, of course, and only get him on an open container charge if they had nothing better to do, saw him at a subway stop, perhaps, while they gobbled snack food and weren't busy elsewise beating up a black person or a protester, he thought as he walked past Mr. Zong's grocery and 99-cent store toward 42nd, seeing a small picket line of gray and bearded union men all tired-eyed and half-spent, chanting at the cold and the spare cops sent to watch them across the street. And this was a small eruption, only the first there would be more, not that he really cared, as the vodka was having its numbing effect by the time he got, somehow, to Broadway, and then he came upon the park. They did not call it the park. They called it the Free University as they stood beneath the flat iron building and the light gray rain around small jury-rigged duct-taped tables on a pedestrian island beside Madison Square Park with instruments and chants and signs pointing within. But everywhere there was the smell, the sound, rain on the plastic of their parkas, the picnic tables, and a hobo woman hawking imitation purses from Chinatown, and some cops arguing real estate theology with the protesters, who called the place the Free University, though the officers disagreed. But we just moved in here. I know, sir, and we're telling you, you have to... We have a permit to set up. This crosswalk is owned by the Flatiron Authority, and they don't... That's some bullshit. Hey, hey, watch it, watch it. We have a permit, damn it. I mean, I, I, we can move. We can move. No, we ain't asking us to move, so we'll move. Just give us... God, just, just give us a second. We'll, we'll move the tables. Jesus Christ. The cops leave satisfied, return to their jobs as glorified bank security guards. He assumes a posture of indifference, sipping vodka beside the hobo woman. 
first, she plays the peddler. Hey, hey, check this out for two bits. Yeah, picked it up off a rummy drunk outside a rice shop. The hell's a bit? He thought. Alligator skin, look at this. Still got the price tag inside. <laughs> Can you believe that? But she sees he isn't interested, gets annoyed. Hey, you with them? Huh? He says. Total chicken shit. That's what this is. That's what all you are. This, you know, uh, of course, I was born in this city. A lot of you kids weren't even born here out of academic or academia. A bunch of chicken shit privateers. Well, you're not going to camp here like those bums last year in the park. I know that. You're going to clean up after yourselves or the cops will make you like those campers. So I'm on Fox News, bunch of shits and punks. By now, he isn't listening. He's drifted somewhere inside the park past the Shake Shack where customer consumers stare bemusedly over their burgers at the people sitting in little circular configurations throughout the park, which is musky, damp, overcast, gray. People on chairs or on benches or standing in circles beneath an arch or a statue. People in circles, seminar style. An instructor among them. One of them, really. No one dressed up. No one superior. No one inferior. Merely a circle of chaff of intellectual conversation? A CUNY professor talking about democracy beneath the statue of Seward. What we think of as participatory democracy is made obsolete in a neoliberal environment in which capital can control the flow of information, not through Orwellian totalitarianism as such, but rather through the manufacture of consensus and the process realizing a society of absolute commodification, such that even the commodification of rebellion is absolute, and, Hey! Lauda! Somebody in the back yells, and... He talks louder about Noam Chomsky and Frederick Jameson, voice straining in his little collared shirt that nobody hears. An environmentalist undergrad or high schooler, hard to tell, punk girl in teal beanie talking green. Environmentalism is the canary in the mine, warning us before it's too late. People nod, people nod off. One black hipster with a skateboard resting against his leg adjusts his horn rims and criticizes Congress and cap and trade. Maybe 100, maybe 200 people flow in and out, take classes, and occupy this, occupy that, occupy algebra, radical recess, protest, songwriting, never more than a dozen at a time, all bored, curious, into the park and out. He is disappointed a bit, perhaps it was the weather, perhaps it was the time, but it smells of a quiet kind of failure, but he's tipsy, so he doesn't care. He passes by an arch, exiting the park beneath the two grizzled anarchists in black and red smoke and talk about the old days, shoot opaque glances at the park. He hears one mutter, we're not in 1968 anymore, Toto. The other sighs, I try not to have expectations anymore. Neither does he, he thinks. And he is satisfied at this, neither does he. Nor has he for years, forever, maybe. When did he stop caring? It was a long time in coming, he thought. Yes. Who was it who said, be drunk, always be drunk, no matter whether on booze or heroin or poetry, be drunk? But why? Why accept the fact that there was nothing else to be all other states were but the state of the deluded, like the man he lived with? like the protesters who believed there was a cure for the illness that streamed in through his window and would kill him, was killing him already in the gray overcast early afternoon after the light rain. But there is not a cure. There is no outside the illness. It is all consuming, all encompassing, a pain within you that can only be numbed for a while before it overcomes him. And that is, after all, what the vodka does, is numb him. He isn't sure how long he's been standing there, looking at the anarchist, looking at him. He looks at his little hobo brown bag vodka. Halfway through, he thinks good. And he continues on. <laughs>
is red for once in places. Certain shades of it pierce through the gray. And the sun follows. Follows him down Broadway, and he is blissfully unaware of the way the colors pop now so dangerously. A new electricity in the air, the threat of a general spring violence. Sees none of it through his vodka haze, but senses, if only through proprioception, a change in the blood flow of this city's artery, for the mass of people is flowing down down like a human stream in which he is a pebble carried along down to Union Square. On the way, he grabs a hot dog. He is drunk out of his wits. He eats it with joy. On the way, he is pushed aside by a Latino kid with a bandana on a scooter chased by cops. They corner him at the end of the street, knock him off his scooter, smash his face into the ground. On the way, there is an impromptu concert of a legion of guitars led by a shaggy-headed celebrity he dimly recognizes from a music magazine he subscribed to once. Union Square unfurls before him a mystery of human flesh, part protest, part carnival, part million-man march, though not quite a million. What then? Thousands at least? Perhaps ten thousand? Screaming, cheering, listening to political speeches on a podium with kiosks set up, hawking revolution, red and black banners and streamers and flags and movements, movements galore, post-colonialists, feminists, LGBTQIA, immigrant rights, advocate, new leftists, Maoists, Marxists, Leninists, anarchists, left libertarians, syndicalists, trade unionist community organizers, all colors, all ages, all together, dancing, cheering, booing, laughing, listening, bored to the pontifications amplified by speakers carrying the roar up and down the great New York avenues, past the high-rises into the afternoon sky, a whole plaza shut down by the masses, traffic recirculated, a legion of cops, but not enough, an effervescence of flesh, joyous, strangely liberated, and he is moved, seeing this, though he is drunk, and he does not understand, and he listens, and what he hears is a librarian giving away old leftist hardcovers from the 20th century, his personal collection, Ten Days That Shook the World, What Is To Be Done About To The Finland Station, Homage To Catalonia, The Struggle Against Fascism In Germany East Of Eden, Books He Found Himself, in Upper West Side sidewalk book sales and smuggled out of Zuccotti during the night raid, asking only that they be loved and read in return, looking at people with an earnest, teary face, saying, there is a special place in hell for book burners like Bloomberg. They'll stick him somewhere with the Mongols and the Caliph that burned down Alexandria. An idiot woman with a tray of sweets. Revolution muffins? Get your revolution muffins here. Who wants revolution muffins? Earnest graduate students from various city comparative literature departments at a booth entitled, What Would a World Without America Look Like? A map of American atrocities throughout the world. A curious Japanese tourist with a camera around his neck takes a photo. Hipster kid taking stock of a booth labeled Revolutionary Communist Front. Revolutionary Communist Front spokesman looking at him narrowly. Hipster kid asks, Hey, are you guys with CPUSA? Spokesman growls at him. We're the RCF, kid. The CPUSA guys aren't real socialists. Hands him a little red book written by RCF's founder, an obscure Maoist from North Dakota who writes about a new synthesis in a massive font with bigger margins. Venerable antique of city trade unions standing on the pavement adjacent to the park, picketing for wage increases summarily ignored by everyone. Young, friendly, punk guy named Spike, picketing outside Bank of America with a sign reading, Don't give in to corporate oligarchy. The employees evacuate, some in fear, most in laziness. One comes out, says, Yeah, I just kind of wanted to take the day off anyway. And Spike, the bank-blocking punk, says, Cool, happy May Day, man. You want a cupcake? While a Dominican woman tries the locked bank door and curses loudly in Spanish.
And finally, a magnificent, ridiculous old man gathering a crowd about him, decked out in full anarchist regalia, military cargoes, boots, brown coat, beret, with something beautiful in his gentle, senile eyes, like grease that catches the light in a street puddle. And he cries that he remembers the finest moments of the left. He remembers the anarchist anthems of the Spanish Civil War that they sang when they went to fight the fascists, and he will sing them today. And he sings them horribly off-key, translated inadequately from Spanish and Catalan, and the crowd sings, too, in an awful cacophony that together gives it the harmonious camaraderie of drunks at a bar, which naturally moves him as he watches with his vodka in his hand, and he even joins in on the final verse, which goes... Let us raise the banner of the revolution, for it will surely lead us to freedom at last. Let us raise the banner of the revolution, for it will surely lead us to freedom at last. So come all ye workers, onward to battle, the forces of reaction shall fall to our might. To the barricades, men, to the barricades, men, for all our futures and the future of mankind to the barricades men to the barricades men for all our futures and the future of mankind only for the revolutionary communist front people to yell profanities at the old man fucking anarchists class traitors go to hell go back to where you came from you piece of shit whereupon the crowd disperses and the old man slinks away all this he sees, not in pieces but at once, a single movement, a single sound in a cluster of moments that pass in quick succession, forever irretrievable. And he feels he has come to an understanding of something that is an emptiness, a sense in which something has been lost in this place among the carnivalesques and the cheers, a duplicity, a fraud in all of this that dooms it from the start. And it angers him. And it saddens him, and it causes him to finish his vodka and throw the bottle drunkenly into an alley and stumble aimlessly within the ocean of the 10,000 people, and then, then, the march to Wall Street begins. It is a massive, miraculous marshal. The police try to stop it by cutting it in half, but they cannot. First the unions, then the occupiers, then the carnival in tight secession, a massive conga line parade, protest, festival of people. Thousands of bodies moving, marching, rioting, filling Broadway from end to end. Colors and banners and emblems, screams and shouts and songs. And there he is amidst it, dazzled, drunk, stumbling along, staring at everything, wide-eyed and open-mouthed, not in awe but in drunkenness, for he has finished the vodka and is beyond comprehending what has happened. And there is a prissy middle-class woman with her poodle trying to cross the street, yelling at a cop, I'm just trying to get through for a second, let me through! I can't let you do that, madam, he says sternly, officially, while beside him three New Yorkers pass him and cut quickly across the street. And there are drums, and there are snares, and there are horn sections, and there are bumuzuelas like some kind of European football riot, and the roar of police helicopters overhead. But most of all, there are chants, chants that echo up through the skyscrapers and ring in his head like a headache. All day, all week, occupy Wall Street. All day, all week, occupy Wall Street. Hey ho, hey ho, police brutality's got to go. Hey ho, hey ho, police brutality's got to go. We got sold out, banks got bailouts. We got sold out, banks got bailouts. The people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. And on and on they chant down the streets of Manhattan while at their heels and on the sidewalks an army of cops on motorcycles and gray and black vans stand in formation, a massive phalanx of riot gear and metal. And only then does he realize dimly that really this is a funeral march, a procession toward Golgotha, and he wants none of it, for he knows what is to come. 
It happens by Canal Street. A man who throws something at a cop, a shoe perhaps, or a brick, no one is quite sure. And they pour out like water through a break in a levee from both sides into the street with truncheons and a van and tear gas. And the massive column of martyrs is split in half and he screams drunkenly and a man in a hoodie is beaten to a pulp and thrown into the back of a truck. And there are limbs flailing and bodies crashing into each other and he has got to get out. And he stumbles unseeing into the mass of bodies, shoving a college girl out of the way and pushes past a distracted cop onto Canal Street, and the march goes on and on into the dimming afternoon, and he cries and howls like a wounded animal, shambling into Chinatown, lost and afraid. beginning to sober up about things in the dimming light of Canal Street. Chinatown practically empty for Chinatown, only a few lost souls, and then just one. The sounds of the march fade to nothing, and the last few store owners have given into their frustration at the police blockade and closed shop, and at last there is only him, alone, as he belongs. It's just as well, he says aloud to no one in particular, for there is no one around to listen. Canal Street is a wilderness, desolate, uncaring, a bare edifice upon which to act out the play of existence. He can see himself getting lost here forever, perhaps he already has. Perhaps the man he lives with will be worried about him. He laughs bitterly to himself. Perhaps he will send a search party. Yes, he says, how he looks for him. They will ask the protesters whether they saw a man of his appearance arrested. They will look for him in this absurd, post-apocalyptic Chinatown of the empty storefronts and the dead echoes, and they will say, where has he gone? And where will he be? He will have died, perhaps died, and they will have to perform an autopsy, split open the chest and the skull, and take a look at the innards, and say what it is that killed him. Was it suicide? Was it a mugging, perhaps? A political assassination? No, <laughs> no, he cackles bitterly. They are fools. They are worse than fools. They could never understand that it is the disease the mortal wound of the world inflicted upon him that flitted through the gray window one gray morning, and how it was killing him the whole gray day. The thing that would kill him had killed everything in him already and makes him only want to die in practice as well as in theory. And no. No, not just him. Not just in him at all. He stops laughing of a sudden falls against a concrete wall and vomits with such violence his entire body shakes no 
nothing at all. He was selfish. He was a fool. A sulce. Just like you should have seen before. The thing in the old man's face. The sound beneath the roar of the march. Of course, he should have known as if he were the only one. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Not a man at all. Everyone was dying. Everyone was dying from the inside out. And God damn it, it isn't his fault. And he's the only one who seems to care. He thinks, suddenly, of the Occupy people. He pities them, absurdly. He of all people pitying them, as if he were not himself worthy of pity. But he is tired of self-pity, and anyway, pity is most powerful when directed outward and mingled with fear. That's what they taught him in the other class, after all. He is too sober numb to it, and when a single blow or his enmity comes back from him and he hates himself for it, for being vulnerable, it is a sensation. What is it? He has never heard of a failed revolution before? But it is not merely a concept, after all. It is the massive bodies off to Wall Street now, and it may get wild and be dispersed like atoms across the universe, inconsequential, minuscule. It is an atom, isn't it, that has the potential to destroy the world through its splitting, and perhaps this is what will happen if one doesn't care. Only he does care, of course. And it was all a ruse, this nonchalance, this apathy, or not a ruse as such, but a phase he wants to grow out of, or a symptom of his disease. But is there a cure? He will write a novel about them, he thinks. And he would, of course, being a writer, and though he is a failed writer, he will do it. He will prove the man he lives with wrong. He will write a sad and compelling character study. It will involve the lives of multiple revolutionaries, a gay man, a Latino woman, and a black man, because he has to be politically correct, after all, and he will be sensitive and authentic and live the lives and aspirations of his sympathy characters and crush them because of course they will start out idealistic only to be confronted by the terror of reality and the sham nature of their rebellion and they will fall into despair and kill themselves and then he will publish it and become famous and give interviews on Charlie Rose and book TV and win major literary prizes and perhaps even the Nobel after all because once he has a career the sky is the limit. And what will it have meant? Nothing. Not that he could do it anyway, but what was even the point of imagining? Just another way of waiting for the disease to run its course, and anyway, who knows? He's just a hack. The world becomes purple at this hour, the sun sinking beneath the sky, and in the empty alleyways of Chinatown it seems almost a dream. He does not know where he is or where he has gone. He isn't on Canal Street anymore. There are high-rises, but there are not too high, and they are clearing out, purple, but overwhelming. He steps out into an open area, and there are people. He walks a block, and there is a park. Something twitches inside of him at the sudden presence of people, but he is attracted as if by gravity to them, for he realizes for the first time today how lonesome he has been wandering these long streets of the city and how he longs for some company, even the man he lives with, how he longs for someone to talk to, to sit down and have a talk about these things with the wound from the hole in the center of his life within and shrinking. So he starts walking. 
and breaks into a jog, and the jog turns to a run as he runs, literally runs, tongue wagging out like some kind of puppy toward the park in the purple light of the evening with the hope of finding someone, and he finds, he finds Columbus Park. Which is not really Columbus Park in the sense of a public park no larger than any public park tucked between various high-rises and exceptional replacing it. Not that kind of Columbus Park, for it was a kind of miracle, the kind of place one finds every lifetime or so that is only ever itself, but also stands for something outside itself, irascible, inimitable, unforgettable. It is China, it is Chongqing in Manhattan, beneath the mulberry trees, where all of Chinatown goes on days off in the calm spring breeze of the purple evening. It is a place of smokers and dancers and talkers, none of it in English, and Erhu bands competing in loudness, playing old folk songs and God Bless America, and singers singing in Mandarin and Cantonese, impromptu dancing, old women gambling furiously at the mahjong tables with cigarettes in their fingers, yelling at each other, throwing money down with a violent intensity, and statues of Chinese Republican heroes, and babies crying in strollers, and the smell of Beijing Kaoya, dumplings, pork, and fried rice wafting in from area restaurants with open doors, and a big black man conspicuously smiling to himself in a park bench adjacent to it all, either a hobo or an undercover cop, yet strangely serene. For it is a universe contained and distilled, a beating heart that takes the place of his own as he walks through it. Only, he is no longer walking through, no longer a passerby, for they have seen him, and they smile, the little ones, that is, a few girls and boys, and a band of Erhu players who are like girls and boys, and they grab him for the novelty of his appearance and form a circle around him and begin to play. And they dance, they dance until he dances. And he dances, and they dance frantically, orgiastically, with purpose and resolve, with abandon until their limbs ache with pleasure, and the darkness of the universe becomes acceptable. And the spring has had its fill of their dancing, and the purple light of the evening dissipates into the eternity of night. Later, after the park has cleared, he is alone again, awake, and the city seems gray. But he does not mind. What has changed? Whatever changes. In the end, the thing he heard in the silence of his bedroom that crawled through the crack of his gray window will end him, will leave him static. What of it? In the end, there will be a time for everything, as an old book once said, time to do everything under the sun, for the sun is always setting, but it also rises again. And even if it doesn't, what of it? If only he could learn to love better. That is his flaw. He wants to love so much. What now, he wonders, standing in the empty park at midnight, somewhere he hears the toll of a bell, what now? Perhaps now he will write his Occupy novel. It will be a sad smile of a novel, wistful, 
gentle with the revolutionary. For one has to be gentle when everything changes, everything fades. He loves them, he realizes. In a way, he loves everything. He will not let it fade. He will take the noblest bits of it and everything and save it forever in the shadowy gap between his words. He will sing, and the song will last forever. And even if it does not last forever, it will be heard. And even if it will not be heard, it will have been sung. And a song is in the singing. And that will be enough. This has been Mayday, a composition of prose poetry and tone poetry by J.M. Cologne and Oliver Marsh.